You're listening to the Dibbly Dobbly Podcast. Remember to like, share, comment, subscribe, and click the bell to make sure you get the latest episodes of the podcast. Be sure to like and share our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and on Instagram. For our next topic of this discussion, Neil, let's talk about MCC, the Marybone Cricket Club, its history Mm. with Lords and with the game of cricket. As we mentioned earlier, Mm. the club was founded in 1787. One of world cricket's oldest cricket clubs. Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong there, Neil. Is it the oldest cricket club in the world, the MCC? Um, It's difficult to establish that with certainty. I mean, a lot of a lot of cricket um, cricket has often been played in the same location for longer periods of time. Um, but whether the, the club that first started playing in that location has a, uh, an active organisational continuity with the club that still plays there is, is debatable. Um, you, you look at a place like Mitcham in, in Surrey, for example, and they've, they've got a very established um, cricket tradition that goes back to the 1740s, I think. But whether it's the same club that still plays there now, yeah, they don't have the paperwork to establish yeah. that. And in fact, we don't have paperwork to formally establish our, our date of foundation because mm. there was a fire that burned down the first pavilion in 1825 and all of our early records were lost. So we don't have documentation yeah. on our early years. But yeah, we're, we would certainly say we're, we're one of the oldest continuous cricket clubs in the world, certainly the most famous cricket club in the world yeah. and probably the most influential in in the history of cricket so whether we're the oldest or not you know i'd be happy with the description i've just given yeah that is it's up for debate um it's always anything in cricket history is, yeah. is always up it for is. debate the science is not settled yeah um so so Neil, just tell us how the club was formed who was responsible who was the person responsible for the formation of the mcc when it first formated well i mean the I may have mentioned earlier the, the origin of, of the Lord's Ground and the, mm. the origin of MCC really ties in with that. Um, we know MCC, the first game that's recorded um, was towards the, I think, the, the very last day of July, 1787. So we must have been in existence by then. There's some debate whether the White Conduit Club that had moved from Islington to Marylebone actually mutated into MCC, which would make our history even longer. But there were a couple of games in 1787 and 1788 where the the two clubs played each other. So the story is clearly not as simple as that. But it, it's, it's probably safe to say that the senior members of the White Conduit Club, men like the Duke of Richmond, the Earl of Winchelsea, um, were the founder members of MCC. And were the same sort of aristocrats who'd been writing the laws of Christ since the 1740s. 1744 was the very first code, and, and actually MCC released its first amended code of, of the laws of cricket in 1788, just one year into its existence. So MCC was really, it wasn't a, a revolutionary new beginning for cricket. It was part of the game's yeah. evolution, and it was simply a, a new club in a new location that had many of the same people involved who've been the most prominent people in cricket for the last 40 or 50 years. The, the same aristocrats who'd um, bankrolled the game, gambled vast amounts of money on, on their own teams and eventually got together to decide, well, we need a common code of laws to make sure we're playing by the same rules. Um, so it was it was part of cricket's natural evolution and probably the fact that it's its founders were all aristocrats. I mean, we don't know the presidents before 1821 with any certainty, but if you look at the, yeah. the list of presidents there in the committee room, and you can actually see them on the, the lords.org website as well, uh, if you look at the list of early presidents, there's you'll go a long way before you find one that doesn't have an aristocratic title, yeah. but at the very least a knighthood or a baronetcy. Yeah. Um, and it's... Uh, it, it's a clear indication of the kind of of people who composed the membership of MCC at the time. It was very, very socially exclusive, and cricket at the, in those days, in the late 1700s, was was dominated and funded entirely by wealthy aristocrats. Yeah, but it really it became it became something bigger than than that because the game itself grew. Um, and it became a popular game that, that people from all walks of life were playing and playing together. 
And in a, in a way, it was one of the, the great mixing, uh, melting pots of, of, of English culture. It was one of the few places on the cricket field where people of all classes could mix, not necessarily in the dressing rooms, but at least on, on the field of play, they, they had to get together and work together as a team. Um, and it was... It was fascinating to see how how the club grew, and there were many precarious times during during its history um, when it might have gone out of business. The most obvious being when Thomas Lord wanted to, to redevelop the ground for housing, but there are others as well. And it was very difficult in those early days of the nineteenth century to make make money out of cricket. If if you look at the historical record, there weren't many games of cricket being played. We had the Napoleonic Wars going on at the time, and a lot, a lot of young men were overseas fighting on the, the Iberian Peninsula or in France and Belgium. Um, and there, there simply wasn't the, you know, wasn't the appetite for cricket around the country, which is why you had things like Garnaran's balloon ascent and other events going on at Lords to keep the money going in, and why people like James Dark opened a tennis court to try and attract new members. And it really wasn't until the 1860s, 1870s that um, cricket started getting organized and started professionalizing in, in England. And as a result of it happening in England, it started happening overseas. And because MCC was this historic, now historic body um, associated with the most prominent men in cricket and the wealthiest men in cricket, it was naturally looked to as, as a kind of governing body. And there were, there were moves at times for a kind of parliament of cricket to be held at Lords, which would have been more like a House of Lords than a House of Commons, yeah. I think. Um, it would have been very much a, an aristocratically governed um, institution. It never quite went as far as a parliament of cricket, but MCC was effectively the governing body of English cricket and, and, and world cricket uh, through yeah. its... Um, you know, the, the secretary of MCC governing IC, being the, the administrator yeah. for ICC right up until, you know, the latter part of the 20th century. Uh, and the fact that that all of these decisions were being made at Lords only reinforced the fact that that Lords was the headquarters of cricket and um, an MCC was was the, the the senior and most influential body in the game worldwide. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's talk about the colours of the club. Even the club doesn't know the origins of the colours that they have at the moment, but the it's club true. had sky blue, blue cl colours originally, mm -hmm. then changed over to what we now know and refer to as the egg and bacon mm -hmm. colours, red and yellow. So just tell us about the origins of the colours, because even the MCC don't know where those colours came from. There's like so many things in our in our history, there's no absolute documentary proof. There are theories. There are likely theories. There are theories that we think are less likely, but we can't discount them completely. Um, the original colours, as you say, were sky blue, and we know this from um, a document left by the playwright Frederick Reynolds, who, when he was made a member, I think in the 1820s or 30s, he wrote about um, having proudly put on the this, this sky blue jacket of the MCC. So we know there were, there were sky blue at that time. We think they changed in about the 1860s um, because we've got a, a boundary flag in the egg and bacon colours. Officially, it's scarlet and gold, but, you know, egg and bacon is how people know it. That's fine by me. Um, from about that period, um, the 1860s. And something significant happened uh, at the ground in the 1860s. For, for a number of years, you know, we, we owned the, the lease of the ground had been originally held by Thomas Lord, then William Ward, then James Dark. The club acquired the lease when James Dark acquired, uh, uh, retired in 18. 60 or 1862 um, but the freehold the actual ownership of the land that lords was built on um, had stayed with the air estate until 1860 when it was bought by a, an entrepreneur called isaac moses um, who was involved in the clothes trade he was also a property developer and he bought the the freehold of, of lords ground um, for about five thousand pounds in 1860 MCC didn't even bid. It, it seemed to have, it either didn't think it was important or didn't, didn't think it had the money. Yeah. So Isaac Moses, like Thomas Lord, wanted to make money out of his investment. Yeah, he, he tried to buy the lease back from MCC on several occasions. The club resisted. Um, eventually he gave in and he agreed to sell the lease to MCC in 1866 at a considerable profit. Yeah, who can blame him? Um, mm. He'd held on to it for a while. He wanted to make money out of it, and he walked off with a tidy sum in his pocket. 
Um, so for the first time from 1866, MCC actually didn't just own the lease of the ground, it was the freeholder of its own property. So nobody else, unless the club got into serious financial trouble, nobody else could have any uh, any influence over the, the future of, of cricket at Lords. But the only reason it was able to take that step was because uh, a member of the club by the name of William Nicholson had advanced the, the club the money to make that purchase. And William Nicholson, um, as well as being a keen cricketer and member, um, he was um, an entrepreneur. He was in the gin trade. Nicholson's gin was one of the most popular brands of gin in London at the time. And if you bought a bottle of Nicholson's gin, it would come with a label with a red and yellow border. So the very fact that we changed our colors around that time to something virtually identical to Nicholson's gin labels hmm. indicates that it might have been a thank you to William Nicholson. Um, yeah. Now, there are alternative theories. Um, the most prominent one is that they are the same as the, uh, the racing colors, horse racing colors of the Duke of Richmond. As I mentioned earlier, the Duke of Richmond was one of the original backers to Thomas Lord, so there is a link there. But we're actually talking, you know, that was 1787, and we're, talk, we're talking 80 years later. The Duke of Richmond in the 1860s was, okay, he was a member, but he wasn't so closely involved with the club as his, as his ancestor had been. So it seems a curious time to make that change for that reason. And, and that's why I would say that the, the Nicholson theory is the most likely one. And the evidence of the Nicholson family themselves, there's a, there's a family legend that that is the reason the club changed its colours as a thank you to William. So that's our story. Um, we, we don't rule out the other theories, but we, we, we're yeah. keener to promote the one we think is likeliest. Absolutely. Um, but, um, you know, it would be good to, to know more, if you can, yeah. um, regarding the colours. Yeah, I mean, if, if it's one of those missing documents that mm. would be great, great to find. Um, yeah. Whether whether it ever actually existed, whether there was ever ever anything written down about it, or whether it was just yeah. one of those things that was done on a handshake, gentlemen's agreements. Yeah. So many things were in yeah. those. I suspect we'll never know uh, unless yeah. something turns up in an archive that we haven't explored yet. But um, there's certainly nothing at Lords. We've been through all the paperwork. Uh, we started cataloguing the archive properly in 2006. We've we've now been through everything of of that era there are there are more details we can dig out but we know there is no document of that kind in the archive that we're missing yeah. so um I, th I think we'll we'll just have to carry on acknowledging that we aren't 100 percent sure but yeah. stays on what we think is the likeliest story behind it yeah um let's talk about the the role of the mcc today as a club uh, we already touched on it about yeah, changing over the years it needs to be in charge of cricket it still is the custodian of the laws, of course, um, and any changes to the laws, it has to go through MCC before it goes to the ICC or changes to um, the laws and playing conditions of the game. Um, but it's changed over its long history now as we touched on. So how is the club keeping relevant to these changing times and, and what sort of contribution is uh, MCC making to world cricket today? I, I think the, the club makes a really strong independent contribution to the health uh, and well-being of the game and, and the future of the game worldwide these days. It is a very different role to what it used to be in the, in the days when we were effectively the game's governing body, but it's nonetheless significant for that. And in many ways, it, it mirrors the, the role of the club in its earlier years before it, it, it had achieved that prominence as a, as a governing body. And that's particularly visible in the fact that we're one of the most active touring clubs in the world, both our men's and women's sections. And we we tour uh, places around the world that you wouldn't necessarily associate with cricket. You know, we go to Sweden, Germany, China, um, Serbia, Italy, Argentina again. I mean, it's, it's, it's nice to see we're still going back to Argentina year after year after year when we, you know, that was one of our earliest non-imperial destinations, if I can put it that way. So we, we go to, to places around the world where the, the very idea of having a, a touring team from MCC, from, from Lords, from the home of cricket, is a really big deal to, to, to the people who are, are learning the game overseas. It's great to know that we can still have that impact and we can still promote cricket 
uh, and promote its growth around the world in the same way that we did back in the, the days of Lord Harris, Lord Hawke uh, and Pelham Warner. But you're right to mention the laws as, as one of our other major contributions. We, we still um, have the copyright to the, the laws of cricket and they're, they're regularly updated to, um, to feature, to, to acknowledge the way the game is evolving. Yep. Um, and also the, the way the laws are written. I mean, the, there is a distinction here between laws and playing conditions, which can be yep. set um, at a variance from what the laws actually say by any governing body in a tournament that they are responsible for. So you'll, you'll see that almost everywhere with the I, IPL, with the 100 in England. You know, there are little tweaks to the laws of cricket that are appropriate to the way the game is being played in a particular format, in a particular place. But the laws are, are formulated in a way that they can be applied anywhere. So whether, whether you're just getting together with 21 friends on a, a piece of scratch ground somewhere in India or on Village Green in England, or you're playing in a test match at Laws, the laws of cricket can be applied to either format. And whether it's a one-day game or a, a, a traditional long-format time-limited game, um, the laws can apply equally to either. So it's it's one of the most tricky balances to actually uh, achieve, to, to, to create laws that are so widely applicable yet remain relevant, acknowledge the, the way the game is evolving, how players make it evolve, um, but also try to ensure that it doesn't evolve too far from its core meaning and purpose. Uh, so, for example, the in the last few years, we've we've had a law that restricts the thickness of cricket bats. Yeah, um, and umpires around the world will carry new gauges to make sure that the, the the bat does not exceed that maximum thickness. And I think that grew out of a perception that it was becoming a little too easy for for batters yep. to hit sixes all the time. So they wanted to to try and manage the the balance of play between bat and ball uh, a little more evenly. So it's it's something that's you know we have a whole department, a whole committee that's that's dedicated to, to following the laws. Fraser Stewart, who is our, our head of cricket now, he's he does a fabulous job with that. He's he's got a, a specialist called Johnny Singer who really is is you know if you want to know anything about how the law should be interpreted um, today, contact Lord, speak to Johnny Singer, he's your guy. Um, he, he knows everything there is to know. But the, it keeps them very busy. Um, yeah. And it's they, they get inquiries about interpretation. I was involved in this for a while. Um, interpretation of the laws from all over the world. And some of the things that, that, would, that would turn up would, um, uh, I can't recall any to mind immediately, but they are incredibly complicated. And yes. You'll sometimes see these these things going viral on, on Twitter and, and YouTube mm. and videos of, you know, is this a legal catch or should that have been allowed? Yes. Um, it's, it's all very, it, it can get very complicated. Um, but it, yeah. it's it's something that the club takes very seriously as, as part of its mission to preserve and promote the game of cricket um, for the future. We've also yeah. got the World Cricket Committee, um, yeah. which you know, meets regularly. Um, it's made up of, of prominent former cricketers, you know, people like Kumar Sangakara, Shane Warne, Mike Gasson have served on it at various times. Um, and it's basically cricketers to get together as uh, gives cricketers an, of, of that kind of experience and prominence an opportunity to get together, discuss pressing issues of the game and act as a sort of independent advisory body that can that can speak to organisations like ICC or, or national governing bodies or even MCC itself with recommendations or concerns uh, about how we ensure cricket is the best game it can possibly be from an entirely independent point of view. Um, so I, I think that's a really important contribution. And then we've got things like the MCC Foundation, which is the club's charitable arm, which does amazing work in, in countries like Nepal and South Africa, and has even been working with Syrian refugees in, in refugee camps in, in Lebanon. Um, I watched a very inspiring video that the, the foundation had put together of, of how their use of cricket was helping to change the lives of young Syrian refugees in Lebanon and, and teaching them the ideas of, of leadership and teamwork and fair play that they can take back with them if, you know, hopefully one day they, they're able to go back and rebuild their country. Um, they can take those values and qualities that they've learned through cricket back 
to to build rebuild their home country in a, in a better way. And some of the 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 words that were being spoken by these young people were really incredibly moving. The experiences they've gone through and yet to find hope and enjoyment through cricket. Um, I can't speak highly enough of, of what the foundation does. Um, and on a, on a smaller scale, we've we've got our own community department, which does great work with uh, local schools, free coaching sessions, um, really making sure people have in in the Westminster area have have the, the best opportunities through cricket that that we can help to provide. So they they do an incredibly valuable job as well. And then there's my own department, um, Heritage and Collections, which looks after the the sort of cultural uh, and, and playing history of the game and, and tries to tell its fascinating stories um, from as wide a range of, perspective, of perspectives as possible and and also preserves it for, for the future. So the, the club has, in my view, an incredibly important role, an independent role in, in the world of cricket today and, and does a lot of good work as well as its most obvious job of, of looking after Lord's Cricket Ground and making sure it's a wonderful place to come and watch cricket and play cricket. Absolutely. And just going back on the laws, where is it? Um, here it is. Oh, God, you've got a copy of the laws behind yes, you. Yes, I've got a copy of the law book here. Because I'm an umpire myself, Neil, so oh. I always have this on hand. This is the, the old code. I need to update it mm -hmm. get a new one. But uh, for those who don't know, that's the blue book. All the important 42 yep. laws are in that. And um, it's quite frustrating as an umpire. When it always gets updated, you have to buy a new one and <laughs> amendments and print them off. And uh, but as we mentioned, it's it's about changing the evolution of the game and, and keeping mm. relevant to those changes, as you mentioned. Yeah. So important piece of kit for an umpire. Uh, this little book, blue book, and people can access the laws on the website. The, the laws are also available on the website. We we also have some lovely animations which were done with uh, the help of the wonderful Stephen Fry. A few years ago to help explain some of the the more convoluted aspects mm. of the laws that, that people get confused about so those those are great entertainment as, as well as being very in, yeah. informative but yeah you, you can read through the laws law by law if you want if you just want to look something up um, they're all available on the website um, lots of lots of material and explanatory material as well that you can find absolutely and those are the e-learning program that I used as well that the NCC mm. have done as well going into further depth of the laws doing it in modules um, and, and looking at different um, yes I mean, that, that, and, that's another yeah. aspect of the work mm. isn't it the, the, the role in, in helping umpires to uh, attain that level of knowledge of the laws that allows them to stand there with confidence and officiate because there's there's nothing worse than than being in a position where you're officiating something and having doubt in your mind about how, how yes. things should be interpreted, interpreted. So it's it's a very important job of work that the club does, does in that respect as well. Ab absolutely. Um, the other question I have on that, Neil, about the uh, the club today is uh, the runnings and the workings of the club. Has it changed over its history in terms of how the clubs run day to day, uh, electing presidents and becoming a member? Uh, so just explain that process that the club continues to do on a mm. daily basis I, I think that the club's always had a very interesting binary structure so you've, you've got the the non-executive structure which is the members the committees uh, and all of that um, and then you've got the executive structure which is paid employees like me um, and right right up at the top you've got someone like the secretary and chief executive who sort of straddles both um, but they're, they're equally important and they ensure that the club is is not just run in a professional manner by the executive, but it's also run for the benefit of its members. We are a club and our members make up the club and you know, without them, we wouldn't be what we are. So we need to keep them very happy. And actually how we, how we acquire members and how people attain positions of influence in the club, the presidency being a good example, it has changed over the years. And we've, the, the, the origin of, of the presidency, we, we don't know, how the presidency was first instituted because of the loss of our early records in that fire yeah. in 1825. But we know as far as, as far back as records go, initially the, the president would be nominated by his predecessor. I say his because until Claire Connor a couple of years ago, it was always a, a man. Um, and that, that nomination would take place verbally at the annual general meeting every May. 
And from that moment, the new president would be in office. The, the change was made in 1951, where the nomination would still take place verbally at the annual general meeting, but the new incoming president would not take office until the 1st of October that year. So they had a bit of lead time where everyone could get used to who this was going to be. And presumably people could lobby, lobby him on you know, whatever their pressing issues yeah. would be before he actually took office. Um, and I, I think that's given presidents since then a little bit more breathing space to get used to what the job's going to involve. Um, obviously, they, don't, you know, they have to give agreement sometime in advance when the income, incumbent president tells yeah. them they are their nomination. And there have been some, I would guess, who've turned it down. But um, for most people, it, it's a great honour and they're happy to accept and it's, it's a significant role in the club because you do have to chair the annual general meeting. You are the club's most prominent ambassador. You're, you're the face of MCC in many ways for the year you're in office. And it's a very, it's a very busy role that, that does require quite a time commitment. Yeah. Um, so that's one aspect of it. And then at, at the very other end, you've got the process of, of becoming a member of MCC in the first place, which has always been... You know, in the very early years, the membership was quite small, just a few hundred people from a very restricted kind of background. They'd, they'd have gone to public school. They'd be aristocrats or the sons of aristocrats. And, of course, up until 1998, 99, they were all men. It was only in 1998 that the club elected to formally allow women to apply for membership. Um, there, was a, there was actually a change in how the application process works in, in October last year. Before that, um, all papers were, all nominations were carried out on paper. It was a paper-based process. If you wanted to become a member of MCC, you had to have a proposer who was a member. You had to have a seconder who was also a member. Then you had to have a third sponsor who was also a member. And then you had to have an endorser. He was either a member of one of the various committees or was a regional representative um, for outmatches. So we've got various people around the country who, when MCC goes off and plays in you know, the north of Scotland, they'll have a local representative who will coordinate the logistics of the club playing over there. We'll keep in touch with local members. So it could either be a committee member or a, a local representative. Um, so it was quite complex. And, and of course, there, there has been traditionally a long wait. It's currently 29 years. We've actually, in the last few months, we've streamlined the process. So now it can all be done online. You don't need so many um, proposers and seconders. You need one proposer. And, and then you, you just need an interview with two endorsers. So the endorsers are still either committee members or, um, or local representatives. But if, if you live in reasonable distance of Lords, you'll be called in for a, a, a face to face interview so that you can explain what your passion is for cricket, why you want to be a member of this great historic club um, and what it will what it will bring to your life and potentially what you will bring to the club as well. Um, mm -hmm. If you if you live further away, this this can be done remotely, potentially if you know if you're living in Scotland, potentially the, the, the local representatives or overseas, we might have local representatives as well. But it's it's a much more streamlined process now. Um, and it does, I, I think it will provide a, a bit more scrutiny of, of, of the, the people who are applying to membership and making sure that they, they want to be members for the, for the right reasons, that they're actually yeah. passionate about cricket or, or real tennis. And, and that's why they want to be a member of the club. They don't just want to have the card to, to show for the social cachet and, and wear the tie in other functions. It, it's, it's really got to be a, a genuine passion for, for the main core purpose of the club. The, the club. Sadly, it doesn't mean that the waiting list gets any shorter. Yeah. In fact, the early indications are that we're having more applications under this new system than we did in the previous. Yeah. So the, it'll be a lot of work for our, our membership department and all the people who've put themselves down to be endorsers. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we, we've, we've held endorser training sessions so that they, they know exactly what they need to do during that, that process. Yeah. It's going to be a lot of work, but I, I think at the end of it, um, over a period of years, we'll, we'll end up with a membership that's more more focused on the, the, the core activity of the club, which, after all, is is playing cricket and making Lords the best ground it can be. Abs absolutely. Um, just a figure. How, how many members does the MCC have 
today, but also across its whole history as well, dating back from the start, if you can put um, a number on that. The, the, the very earliest membership list we have is from the 1830s. <clears throat> and I think you're looking at that stage of a membership of around about 100. By the 1860s, it had got up to about 600. Um, there have been various um, little spurts of activity. In the 1960s, for example, um, the waiting list was quite short. Even in the 1860s, it was quite short. I think W.G. Grace was proposed, seconded, and elected in the space of a week um, when he became a member at the very young age of, um, I think he was 20 or something when he, when he became a member. So it wasn't always as long as it is. Um, and sometimes when the, the club has been in need of money for developments, it, it has actually sold life memberships or accelerated the process of, of becoming a member so that you could you would get more income from memberships, membership subscriptions. So when we were rebuilding the tavern stand in the 1960s, that, that was a, a case in point. We, we sold life memberships. People could become members much more quickly. And the club had a boost in its um, in its revenue as, as a result, which allowed it to pay for that redevelopment. Um, but it, yeah, up, up to today, uh, in the modern world, and certainly um, for the last few years, we've had a uh, eighteen thousand full members and uh, and a further five thousand associate members. Now, associate membership is a category where. Um, you don't get all of the privileges of, of being a full member, so you, you don't get to come into the ground on the first three days of a test match, but days four and five you usually can. Um, you, you, you're still getting quite a lot for your money, and, and you can become an associate member much, much more quickly, less than 10 years. So already, if, if you're on the waiting list, you, you qualify for, for associate membership, you're, you're starting to get the benefits of being part of MCC, not full benefits, but you're getting some benefits reasonably quickly, which I think helps helps people cope with the, the idea that it'll be 29 years before they can yeah. become a full yeah. member and potentially, you know, start serving on committees and taking a more active role in the yeah. club. The other, um, the other that, thing I should mention yeah. is, is playing members. If, if yeah. you're a good cricketer, by far the, the quickest way to qualify as a member is by playing a certain number of qualifying matches. I, I'm not sure exactly how many it is at the moment. But that, that's the way that we get more young members in and more female members as well, because the, yep. the club, obviously, we changed the rules in the late 1990s, but we've only just got to the point where the first pe first women qualifying through the, the, the most straightforward way, the, the traditional route of waiting 29 years, they're only just now starting to come through. Yep. So the, the, the demographics of, of the club in terms of youth and gender are changing much more rapidly through its playing sections, um, through yeah. young cricketers, both male and female, coming in through that route. Uh, absolutely. Um, just um, a last bit on that before we move on to the next question. Um, honorary members, um, mm. which the club bestows upon former players um, and other people who've made a significant con um, contribution to the game, how does that process work of becoming an honorary Member of that's MCC. that's a discretion, discretionary decision taken by the the MCC committee, so they can effectively do it at any time. Yeah, um, you probably don't want to do too many at once because it's you know, it, it needs to be something yeah. that's special. But for example, off, after the Second World War, um, the, the the club made a, a number of significant figures who had been part of, of the, the wartime campaign against Nazism to to become. Uh, members of the club. These included um, President Dwight D. Eisenhower of the United States of America. He became an honorary life member of MCC. I don't know if he ever used it um, or valued it particularly, but the, yeah. the honor was there. Um, there were other people like um, Field Marshal Montgomery who did use it and was very keen um, to, to come along to Lords, loved his cricket. And not long after that, we, um, I forget the exact year, but a number of Overseas cricketers, um, professional cricketers. This was this was around the time that um, Len Hutton became the first professional captain of, of MCC, and when he stepped down, stepped down um, as England captain and retired from the game, he was made a member of MCC, even though he was a professional cricketer, which hadn't been done before. Right. So, an, a, around that time, a, a number of prominent overseas cricketers were also made on real life members uh, for, for pretty much the same reason, because we. We were still very much um, a traditional English amateur-focused club up to that point. Yeah. 
Um, you mentioned President D. Um, Eisenhower. Interesting mm -hmm. trivia question. He is the only U.S. president to watch a day's test cricket, and that was in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pakistan and Australia in 1959, last test. Mm. And uh, he was there watching cricket with his Pakistan counterparts. So an interesting stat for, for those who may not know. And you will know about that stat in our historical series that we did on that 1959. Australian tour to Pakistan and India, which they won both series, obviously. And, and I do mention that in the episode. So do check mm. that out, everyone. Interesting trivia question there that he's the only US president to watch a game. I know, it's a lovely story. Um, we, we've, got yeah. a, we've got a photograph of that, which um, we were lucky enough to receive from uh, the man who looks after the history of Pakistan cricket over for the Pakistan Cricket Board, Yaya Ghaznavi, who's a, a lovely chap and we've worked closely with for a number of years. Um, he, he sent us a, a, a few photos of early um, Pakistan cricket, even pre-partition. And it, it, it was an important visit for the Pakistanis because, you know, they were, yeah. a, they were a very new nation at the time. And how, how could they express their new sense of nationhood? How better than, than through cricket? That's why Eisenhower actually came to the test match because it was something Pakistan wanted to show off. Here we are competing on the world stage against the best in the world as a very young nation. Um, so it was, it was part of the, an example of how cricket has been used to foster diplomacy and, and soft power over the years. Yeah, absolutely. And um, it was also the last test match in Pakistan that it was played on matting. After was that. It? I didn't realise that. That's yes, it was, because the story was um, just digressing a little bit from our discussion. But anyway, the thing was that they were playing on those pitches in Pakistan with matting. And ever since Pakistan played test cricket, they played on matting. Mm. And Australia knew this. So for the 1959 series, Richie Beno said to the groundsman at the, at the Gabba, which is Woolen Gabba, which is in Brisbane, he said to the curators, can you prepare a canvas sort of strip in the outfield where we can practice on the mat because we know we'll be playing on the matting pitches in Pakistan. The Australian Cricket Board and the PCB, the communications broke down. Back then they were using tele telex machines and it broke down. The communications broke down because Australia didn't want to play on matting. They wanted to get that assurance from the PCB. But the communication lines broke down, obviously, in those days. Mm -hmm. This is 1959. And so Richie Benno being the brilliant cricket captain and mind in the game was forward thinking he decided let's prepare on these campus pitches in Brisbane because they were playing an exhibition match up there in Brisbane which was a Richie Benno 11 and a Linwall 11 Ray Linwall Australian fast bowl uh, to celebrate Queensland centenary so that so each morning of the test or not the test the the game they would practice the test squad that was going to go over to Pakistan and India so when they got to Pakistan Australia won that series 2-0. There was one draw, and they were prepared on the pitch, uh, on the pitches over there, uh, battling through illness. Neil Harvey battled dysentery. He got 96, had to leave the field half a dozen times, but Richie Benno said that was probably one of the best innings I've ever seen. So anyway, Australia won that series, and then came down to the last test with Eisenhower there, and Richie Benno and Sam Loxton, who was a member of the Invincibles in 1948, who went with Don Bradman in that famous series mm -hmm. in England. He was there with Richie Benno because he was the team manager of Australia. So Richie and Sam, um, Sam Loxton was a, a master with the words, and he came over with Richie, seizing this opportunity to meet Eisenhower and to meet the Pakistan president, Arub Khan. And he said to Arub Khan, well, both of them did, they said, you will be regarded in the cricketing world a lot higher than you are at the moment if you play future test matches on turf, um, wickets instead of matting. Mm -hmm. So from then on in, the matting became a relic of the game, and that's how Sam Loxton and Richie Benno changed matting pitches in the game, and there were no more in Pakistan. And I don't know, because of Eisenhower's presence there, so the Pakistan president thought, oh, I better you know, consider this. Mm -hmm. And um, I think Eisenhower questioned it as well. He said, usually you play cricket on turf, not matting. <laughs> and and I think Richie Benno said, uh, Mr. President, um, in Pakistan they play on matching because that's how they win uh, the game, essentially. So that's that's a little bit of history there, just digressing mm -hmm. a little bit from our discussion, Neil. But you learn story. something new every day in the game of cricket, do you? Oh, you do. I mean, I, I, I've been at Lord 17 years now, as I say, but I, I still learn new stuff all the time. Absolutely. Um, just our last question before we move on to our next topic of this discussion. 
Um, the royal family, Neil, and we were talking about this before we went on, mm. about Her Late Majesty the Queen and her his um, late Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh, who were a big part of MCC and Lords. Uh, the Queen was patron of MCC for a very long time in her 70-year reign. Uh, she visited Lords on many occasions with her husband, the Duke, uh, to watch test matches and be greeted by the players on the field. Um, Prince Philip was a keen cricketer himself. He, as we mentioned earlier, he was president of MCC on two occasions, 1949 mm. to 1974. Um, he opened the new Warner stand in 2017, which is a funny video of him unveiling the plaque on YouTube that I saw. Mm. Um, a sense of humour um, from Prince Philip there. Uh, he also presented the first World Cup to Clive Lloyd um, in 1975. Uh, when the West Indies defeated Australia in that final. So, Neil, what does the connection between Lords and the MCC with the royal family regarding the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh and various other monarchs in British history? And when did the tradition of the monarch meeting the players during a test match start at Lords? I, I think the um, the origins of our know, patron was Her Majesty Queen, Queen Elizabeth II, um, and before that, every monarch going back to George V had had been our our, our club patron, which is something we've we've been very you know, delighted to receive the patronage of each successive monarch since you know, the, the the first the very early years of the twentieth century. Um, and I, I think there's there's no clear point when the tradition of of the monarch going out and and shaking hands with the players on on the field meeting them all usually at the tea interval in a test match day there's there's no established clear point when that started or i think like a lot of traditions it, it just it happened once and then it happened yeah. again and then all of a sudden you've got a tradition on your hands yeah um we've, we've got photos of um george v and his son the future edward the eighth um meeting the players on the outfield in the years just before the first world war and it, it was probably around that time that the tradition started. Now, it doesn't happen every year, every test match, but, you know, it, it's notable that the the late queen, um, she came on so many occasions. This is another thing. You can just you Google images yeah. um, on royal visits to Lords, and you will see the queen meeting so many different cricketers over so mm. many years. Um, it's really quite astonishing. And I'm sure she enjoyed her visits to Lords. Um, she only stayed for lunch once in 2009 when, rather concerningly for the staff, she requested a bottle of, of the liqueur du bonnet, which we didn't have any in stock of. So somebody was quickly dispatched to a local off license to try and find a bottle and, and had to, to bring it back in through the security checks to make sure Her Majesty's thirst was satisfied. But um, that, that, was, that was the only time she, she stayed for lunch, but she always she had a dedicated seat in the committee room. And of course, interestingly enough, um, she was one of the few women permitted to enter the pavilion, um, apart from staff. And even staff were, were banned from the long room for many, many years, um, with the exception of, of one of my predecessors, the first curator of collections, Diana Ray Carr, who obviously had to go in there to look after the pictures if anything happened to them. So she was granted an exemption. But other than that, it was only the queen who was allowed to um, occupy any part of the pavilion um, unless they, they had a job of work to do. So she she was always warmly received. Um, I think she enjoyed it, but she, it, it was obviously her husband, the Duke of Edinburgh, who was the real cricket fan in the family. Yeah. And in fact, his his two terms of presidency were very significant for the, for the club. As you said, the, the second one in 1975, he, he presented the very first World Cup trophy to, to uh, men's World Cup trophy, I should say, to, to Clive Lloyd at Lords after they'd beaten Australia in that final. Um, but in 1949, when um, you have to remember, he was he was still fairly newly married to, to Princess Elizabeth, as she was then, still a serving naval officer, um, in, enjoying the, the kind of normal life, as, as normal as they could enjoy in their position mm. bef before she ascended to the throne on her father's death. He gave such a lot to the club during that year. He, um, in particular, he, he took a keen interest in the promotion of youth cricket and he formed a cricket inquiry committee under Harry Surtees Oltham, who was, who was one of the, the great figures of, of early 20th century cricket at MCC. Um, and and they, they looked into what could be done to promote cricket more widely in state schools, 
and amongst the youth of the country more generally, um, boys and girls um, in all classes. And a lot of the work that, that the Duke of Edinburgh and Harry Oltham set in train over the course of that year can really be seen in the work that our community department does today or in work that, that people like Chance to Shine, the ECB charity, do, do around in schools around, around the country. So it was, it was really a step change for MCC in terms of seeing the development of youth cricket beyond the narrow perspective of public schools and the kind of boys who were the sons of, of MCC members. It was the first element of really socially inclusive promotion of cricket that, that we'd experienced at MCC. And it was thanks to the Duke of Edinburgh that it happened. Yeah. Um, and he was passionate about sport as well, the Duke. Um, we have the Duke of he Edinburgh uh, scheme and award. Um, keen on that and promoting younger people to test if themselves he, and challenge themselves, didn't he? If there were two threads that, that ran through his life, um, there would probably be promotion of, of opportunities for young people in all spheres, which, you know, the Duke of Edinburgh Award was, was the, the long-standing example of that, um, and also sport. And I think he saw the two as being coexistent. And a lot of a lot of people who've, who've really promoted cricket over the years, going back to the likes of, of Lord Harris uh, and other, other Victorian pioneers of the game, they've seen cricket not just as a game, but a, as a way of promoting the values that they saw as essential to a healthy society, like teamwork and fair play um, and, and honesty on, on the field of play. The, the spirit of cricket really grows out of that attitude. Um, and the, the work that the Duke of Edinburgh did, not just in cricket, but in society generally, was, was incredibly valuable. And we were lucky to see uh, a strong element of that in his work with, with MCC during his, his two terms of presidency. Absolutely. And, and the club must have been really devastated to hear the passing of the Duke, of course, when he passed and, and the Queen last year, of course. Um, we were, of course. I mean, it, when, when people die at such an advanced age, it, it's probably an exaggeration to, to say tragedy. But it, is, mm. it marks the end of an era. Um, and there is a sadness to think that um, you know they will never, they will never come to Lords again. It was, it was always a special occasion. There was a lovely atmosphere whenever there was a royal visit. And I remember when when the Duke turned ninety, he had a celebration lunch at Lords mm. um, in the committee dining room, and it was um, it was a a lovely occasion. He went round the museum um, looking at the exhibits before going into lunch. Um, a lot of his friends were there. It, it was a great occasion, and it was it was nice to know that he he chose Lords as a location for yeah. one of those places. It wasn't the only celebration he had, but it was one of the places he chose yeah. to celebrate his his special ninetieth birthday. So it's it's nice to know that that Lords had such a, a a strong place in his heart that he would he would want to do that. Yeah, absolutely, and um, yeah, just. Um, part of Lord's history, I suppose, the, the Queen and, and the Duke, of course, um, coming to, to watch a day's play or visit a, a visiting team or the England team, of course, and getting presented to that. And many players talk about that, meeting Her mm. Majesty. Uh, were you mm. lucky enough to meet uh, the Duke and Her Majesty? Never, sadly. I, I, was, um, I was standing when the Duke came through the museum on his 90th birthday occasion. I was, I was in the museum, primed and ready to answer any questions he might have, but he, he didn't, yeah. sadly. He, he walked past me with a smile and, and, and that was that. So I, I've never had the opportunity to meet um, to meet royalty. Um, I might have done. Uh, there, was, there was an occasion just when, um, when COVID struck us, sadly, three years ago, um, as, as with any organisation of which the, the, the late Queen was patron, yeah. um, a certain number of representatives of those organisations get invited to royal garden parties at Buckingham Palace. Yeah. And um, in 2020, my name came up. I was I was due to go along, yep. um, and and visit Buckingham Palace for a garden party, and I, I was thrilled. Yep. Not least because the date selected happened to be my birthday, <laughs> um, so it was it was doubly important. But then, of course, yeah. the pandemic hit, and, and yeah. everything was cancelled, so it never happened. I never had my opportunity. But maybe maybe I'll be lucky again in a in maybe a um, yeah, with the King Charles the Third. Um, will he yeah. assume patronage of MCC? Um, we hope so. Um, I, I, I'm not sure whether the invitation's been sent yet, whether or whether it needs to wait for a period of mourning to to um, pass by. But um, yeah. certainly, I'm, I'm sure that's the hope of everyone at the club. 
Absolutely. And um, uh, they're sadly missed. Uh, two wonderful people, um, mm. sadly, sadly missed, um, but devoted a lot of service to their nation and to their people, and and uh, we thank them for them. And uh, just sad, but but hopefully, his uh, his Majesty the King can live up to his uh, mother and father and make us all proud of of, uh, of what uh, her, her late Majesty did, and hopefully Absolutely. continue that tradition of um, of the monarch and the and the sovereign. Um, hi everyone, hope you enjoyed part three of our historical series episode, looking back at the history of Lord's Cricket Ground and the MCC with Head of Heritage and Collections, Neil Robinson. I hope you enjoyed listening to Neil and I talk about the history of the MCC, the Marybone Cricket Club. Stay tuned for part four of our historical series episode, looking back at the history of Lord's Cricket Ground and the MCC with Head of Heritage and Collections, Neil Robinson.